notice how much harder it is to love and know someone that you aren't close to? And I mean that in a couple of different ways, like close to them geographically, proximity wise, like it's much harder to know somebody who's on the other side of the world than it is to know the person next to you. But I'm also talking about relationally because you can be next to me and you might not be close to me. I might not be open and honest and uh, real with you so that you can get close to me. I mean, really, this is how our mind creates enemies. We create space between me and somebody else. And so suddenly, when there's people I don't like, it's those people, that group. And I can put labels on them that put a distance between me and who they are. And I don't have to mix with those kinds of folks anymore. And when often I ask people about people they don't like, and I say, when was the last time you knew someone, had dinner with someone in that group, uh, had a conversation with them? Usually the answer is it's not happened in a really, really long time. If you want another example about how hard this is to make it happen, uh, just watch one episode of Married at First Sight. And I just recommend just one episode. It's probably all you really need to get into for that. But there's such a low success rate of the couples on that show because it is just hard to love and know someone that you are not close to. And so the creator of the universe, like we talked about last week, longs to love us. The truth is he does love us already, but he longs for us to love him back. I mean, that's the reason why we exist. But there is something in creation, something inside of us that has broken that. We call it sin, and we'll talk a lot more about that in some coming weeks. But for now, all you need to know is that you have a sense, you have a feeling every so often that something just isn't right. That something isn't how it's supposed to be. Either something that's been done to you or something you've done or something you wish you had done but didn't do. All these things play out in making you feel that something just isn't right. And that isn't rightness has created a distance relationally between us and God. There is a distance, a chasm that on our own, we aren't going to be able to cross to get close to him. And it is hard to love people you're not close to. And then other people have a question when it comes to loving God about just the, the distance experientially, right? If he is God, he is so different than us. How can he relate to us? How can he know what it's like to be me, to go through what I go through, to deal with what I deal with? And so our di struggles make there an experiential distance between us and God. If you want to know what this looks like, I want you to think about watching House Hunters. Now, we used to watch that a lot more when we had cable and stuff on TV. And at the time, Megan was substitute teaching. And there was a substitute teacher on one of the episodes. And so we thought, okay, this is someone we can relate to. Let's watch this show. Let's see what happens. And so it's the substitute teacher who's on this show in an area close to us and they have a budget of their house hunting for $900,000. At which point I looked at Megan and said, why are you subbing in a school system that doesn't give you a $900,000 budget to go looking for a house? There was an experiential difference there between our lived life and what we have access to and what this person has access to. So everything they were looking for, all the questions they were asking, didn't make any sense to us because it was so out of reach. And so this is where Jesus enters in. This distance relationally, this distance experientially, God longs to close that distance because he loves us and he wants us to love him back. And so Jesus shows up basically with one question, how close will you let me get to you? How close will you let me get to you? Knowing who Jesus is, is really the defining question of most of our lives, if not all of our lives. It's the defining question of what creation really comes to. And so you have to kind of get this right, and you don't have an option of not dealing with it. Everybody, everybody has to come up with an answer to this. Whether it's a good one or not is a different question. And so a lot of people think Jesus is just a myth. It didn't really exist it was just something that was written a long time ago and written down and we, we deal with it and everything's fine that way because then we can just write it off. And I, I'll just a sidebar on this one. There is more evidence for Jesus than there is for Julius Caesar by a lot. And so if you want to historically say there was a person named Julius Caesar, then you have to at least historically say there was someone named Jesus 
who lived in that first century in Palestine. For others, he's just a, a great idea, like he has good ideas. He's a good teacher that we can go and learn some stuff from on how to live well with, with other human beings. For others, he's just he's kind of an illusion. He just looked like a human being, but really it was, it was God, kind of a spirit, kind of working through things. For other people, he's kind of on star. Maybe this is more your speed. So you are great at controlling your life, but as soon as something goes wrong, then you call on Jesus. And so it's like when you're in your car and you're driving and then something breaks or the emergency light goes on and then OnStar comes in and tells you what's going on and, and sends you help. And so that's how you want Jesus to be. Let you do your thing, drive where you want to go, the speed you want to go, where you want to go, all of that. But as soon as something goes wrong, then it's ready to call on Jesus. He's the OnStar for your life. But the truth is, no one argues this point well. There hasn't been a person in history with a greater influence and impact on the world than Jesus. Whether you think it's good or bad, no one has had more of an impact than he has. So why do we have so much trouble figuring out who he is and answering that question? Throughout the history of the church, every time we get something wrong and go off course, it's usually because we have gotten Jesus wrong. And so instead of having Jesus show up and have him be who we want him to be, maybe we can let him be who he says he is. We find out who Jesus says he is through his life that we have recorded in Scripture, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the whole Bible helps speak into this. And so who does Jesus say that he is? Well, one of the first things Jesus says he is is that he is 100% God. He and the Father are one. He was there at creation. In fact, creation happens through Jesus. So he's not just some guy. He's not just some nice teacher. He is God. He said this himself over and over again in Scripture, but one of the easiest places to find him is all of the places in the Gospel of John where he says, I am something. So I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am whatever he says next. Those I am statements in his culture, to say I am was to say the name of God. You didn't do that. And so he was claiming to be God every time he said one of those statements. And so he was either who he says he was, or he was incredibly, incredibly mentally ill. There isn't a lot of room in between. But not only was Jesus 100% God, he was also 100% a human being. We call this the incarnation, and it's, it's hard to, to get our heads wrapped around that both of these things are true at the same time, but they are perfectly and 100% true at the same time. Jesus is 100% God and 100% human being in one. You see, God didn't just see someone growing up at this time and say, you know what, that's a, that's a cool dude. I like this guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt him and put my spirit on him, and then he'll become the Son of God. You see, you know, he was that beforehand. And he didn't just show up and play act being a human being. Like, I'm really God, but I just put on this little suit that looks like it so I can cosplay my way through creation for a little while as a human being. He was fully human. He was born to a woman. He had flesh. He had blood. He had to deal with his parents and his siblings. He went through puberty. He knows what mosquito bites are like. He is a human being. Fully God, fully human, both at the same time. Why? Because this was the best way that God knew to close the distance relationally and experientially between us and him. The Apostle Paul, we can read a lot about in the book of Acts, and a lot of his letters make up the New Testament. His life is really the story of how different views of Jesus shape your life. For the first part of his life in the book of Acts, we read about Paul as this guy who believes Jesus is a dead liar. He is not who he said he was, and he has been killed, and he is gone. And anyone who brings up this idea that he's alive, anyone who brings up this idea that he's God, they need to be snuffed out by any means necessary. And so he gets backing from 
ruling people to go out and arrest and to kill and to do whatever he needs to to wipe this out until one day when he's going up the road towards this town called Damascus, he actually runs into this living Jesus that he thought was a dead liar. And nothing about Paul's life before looks the same as what his life looks like after. Knowing Jesus changed everything for him. And so the Jesus that Paul meets he writes about and one of the ways that he describes him is in Philippians chapter 2 and he says this is who Christ is. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, Jesus is God boldly declaring his love for us Asking, how close will you let me get to you? I'm going to take care of everything that could possibly get in the way of us coming together. How close will you let me come to you? What besides love motivates someone like this? Why else would he give up the privileges that he had in heaven, sitting on the throne, surrounded by the glory that is there, enjoying everything that he wills being done perfectly, angels worshiping, people watching, and to give all of that up for the smelly, hairy, gross, dirty bodies that we have, for the bodily functions that we have to, to go through. Why in the world would you do that? Would you experience hunger and exhaustion, laughter and work and all of that with, without there being a reason like love motivating you? And while Jesus often ended up before kings and wealthy and powerful people, he lived humbly. Most of the time, with those who were relationally the furthest away or the hardest to get close to. People like lepers who were literally cast out of their communities and had to yell at people who were getting too close to stay away. He would go to prostitutes and tax collectors, people who their society had cast out as worthless and uh, traitors and those you did not want to deal with. He would spend time with them. He would find the most hopeless people he could. And that is where he would spend his time. And he showed this by being born to nobodies in the place where the animals were housed instead of going to the palace of the king. He showed this by picking his best friends among those that nobody else wanted. The reason they were available for Jesus to pick is because all of the other rabbis had come through and said, you know what, I'm good. I don't need people like you, Peter, and you, James, and you, John. When he could have said the word and walked away, instead he humbly died for you and I to close the distance. It wasn't an easy death. It was public torture. It was hard. It was what you did to the people you wanted to make examples of. Why go through all of that unless unconditional love was driving you? Unless you truly wanted what was best for the other people that you loved and you were willing to do anything for them? You would do anything to be with them. You would do anything to understand them. You would do anything for them to know your love. This is a far cry from what Jesus did, but I get it just a little bit because in college when Megan and I were starting to, to date and go out with each other and getting to get to know each other, wanted to show that we loved each other, one of the things that I did to let her know that I loved her was I would get up and go to breakfast. My habit before then was be to sleep into the very last minute and then get up and go to class or do whatever else I needed to do that day. I was not going to get up early and get dressed and all those things to go eat breakfast when I can just grab something quick on the way instead of sitting in the cafeteria. But that was one of the things that she really enjoyed to do to start her day. And so to be with her 
I was willing to get up earlier. If you know me, that's a hard thing. To be with her, to get to know her better, to show her that I cared about her, I was willing to do the things that were needed to close the distance between us. Now take that and multiply it by as big a number as you can think of, and that is what Jesus was willing to do for us. You see, the incarnation reveals to us the relentless, never-ending pursuit that God has undertaken to find his wayward children and bring them home. And if this is who Jesus really is, if this is who he truly is, then one thing is really true. There are so many things we can go into about what this means for us, but one thing is really true. God has proven that he loves you. God has proven that he wants to intimately be close to you, be known by you, to be loved by you. He's proven that he can relate to what you're struggling through in this life and that he wants to be there with you in the midst of it. You see, if you feel like you are completely alone and no one wants to be with you, then you are believing a lie. He does. If you're like, he doesn't know what it feels like to be abandoned by friends and family, to be betrayed, to feel unwanted, well then you don't know who he is because he gets that. If you've watched others suffer and die, if you're caring for those who are sick, he gets that too. If you've lost loved ones he, and are grieving, he understands. If you're hungry, if you're struggling to have enough, if you don't know where you're going to eat or live or take care of your kids tomorrow, he knows what that feels like. He has lived what you've lived. And because of that, you can trust him. Because he's proven his love for you, because he wants so much to be close to you, you can love him too. You do that because he's first loved you. And if you are sick, if you feel outcast from others, if you are hopeless, if you are powerless and broken, guess what? He has a special closeness to people just like you. The incarnation helps us experience this deep love of God like never before. And this is why getting Jesus right matters. Because he's more than just a good idea or a nice person from long ago. Jesus is the one who gets me and will do anything, anything to be close to me. And so I don't have to go through life alone. I don't have to go through life totally being misunderstood for the rest of my life. He understands, and he's there. And he is asking you, and he's asking me, how close will you let me get to you? I've done everything on my end to make sure I can get as close as possible to you. So what's your answer back to him? Lord, I am so grateful that you have done everything so that we can come to you. I'm so grateful that you love us so much that you would be willing to do all of that so that we could be close to you again. So that we could know you truly and deeply and you could know us the same way. That you could reveal to us who you are in such a way that we would get it and we would feel understood and we would feel accepted and we would feel welcomed and we would feel loved because all of those things are true. And so God, however close you want to get to us, that's how close we want to get back to you. So help us to do our part, to open ourselves up to you, to be willing to let you get close, to not try and put up a a front or a facade, but to be really who we are before you so that when you come in close, just like you did to Paul, you will change everything around because we've finally gotten you right. And if we're here today and this is us and we want to experience that, maybe even for the first time and we're ready to let you get close, then God, this is what we pray. Lord, we pray that we will know you as the one who has come, who has died, and who lives again for us. 
the one who has taken care of anything we've ever done and is ready right now to forgive us. And so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of the things we've done that have broken your heart and caused a distance to grow between us. We pray you would help us not just to feel sorry for them, but to turn from them and turn to you. We pray that you would do what you've promised you would do, that you would forgive us, that you would give us a new life, that you would make things right with you, and you would adopt us into your family so that we have a place to belong for eternity. And may you fill us with your spirit so that each day we would get closer and closer and closer to you. We pray these things in your name.